Hello and welcome to Tex Talks. I am Tex and today I am talking to a bona fide legend of the SA electronic music scene. I'll take it. Rising to prominence in his solo capacity and also as one half of the DJ duo Crazy White Boy, who consistently churned out massive chart and danceful bangers in the 2000s. He has played some of the world's biggest clubs and stages, but his most eclectic project has come with the formation of African collective Bantuanas, as well as the launch of his own label and imprint Swoon. I am, of course, talking about the stupidly busy Ryan Murgatroyd. But first, we need to mention our awesome studio sponsors for this season. SDFD Studio, a world-class recording facility opened by local music specialists, Sit the Folk Down. Their services range from audio and post-production work to mixing and mastering and everything else audio-related. Get in touch with them at studio at stfd.co.za for audio recording and music-related needs. Mix Room Studios is a boutique, electronic music-focused mixing and mastering studio. And if you're making cool electronic music, you probably need your beats to be polished. So hit Mix Room Studio up at info at mixroomstudios.com for more info. Ryan, welcome. What's up? Thanks for having me. I'm Thank really you. happy that I could steal you away for a bit to talk to me. I know that we are in Mix Room Studios, yeah. your studios uh, in Johannesburg, but I just see you running backwards and forwards. Yeah, I'm, um, not, I'm just pretending to be busy. <laughs> but uh, thank you for, for letting me raid your tea cupboard. Yeah, my pleasure. Sorry it's so messy in the kitchen, my bad. Um, <laughs> no, it's, no, it's not at all. My, you must see my kitchen at home. It's just, okay. it's silly. Yeah. Um, but the studio is fantastic. Thank you. It's so really So Mixroom's rad. actually not my baby, Mark. Mark. It's Mark's business. I just have like a, a small uh, hand, hand in it. And then my room is upstairs. So we do all the post-production downstairs and all the creative super creative sketching my rooms upstairs i'll give you a tour just now so yeah i mean i moved the whole idea of, of this place was like to make basically make a riding camp like a 24 hour 24 7 live-in riding camp um and yeah that was just after years of struggling like always having my office and my house separate and um I wanted to move it all into one property and live with all the maniacs that I create music with and just see, like I said, one last stand, like after the crazy white boy thing, I wanted to relaunch the Murgatroyd solo career. And so, yeah, we thought we'd just give it a 24-7 sort of camp feel, which is great. It's been cool. I'm fully immersed here. I'm very happy. And how long have you been here for? Um, three and a half years since I moved back to Joburg. So, yeah. so I think three, like after three and a half years, I think it's safe to say that it's going quite well. No, it's going pretty well. Yeah, it's going well. Uh, like I'm still trying to cross that threshold to being as busy overseas as I, as I am here. Cause, um, in a way I kind of feel maybe I'm a bit overexposed in South Africa. Like I did some 50, 60 headline shows in, in South Africa, which is too much because I ultimately am an underground artist and it's got to kind of stay it's got to stay quite niche and yeah it's getting it's not getting mainstream but in within the sort of local house scene it's gotten a bit more mainstream so i think over the next couple of months i'm just trying to diversify many more shows overseas um and yeah just be sort of like a guest international in south africa because i think it's it's important to, got you. to keep that boundary yeah and how have you seen i mean you've been in the game for a while how have you seen the scene change over the years in south africa specifically um, I think more people are making music than ever, which is good. I also think people's attention span in general is shorter than ever. So it's hard, it's very hard to make prolific creative work because our brains have been ruined by the internet. So I actually feel sorry for artists that are just starting because when I, when I was starting this, you know, you had one sound engineering book and that's what you had and you had one program and you learned it for 10 years before you got another program and there's so many plugins, so much choices. So yeah, I think there's a lot of good music coming out of South Africa. I'm obviously a very cynical person by nature. Um, I don't hear a lot of great music coming out of South Africa, but there are obviously exceptions to, to that rule. Um, so yeah, and then scene wise, um, it's definitely bigger than ever. Like if you just look at the numbers of parties and tickets mm. sold and festivals and the amount of companies doing promotions and just events it's it's absolutely gigantic um yeah i mean so obviously that's positive for us because artists are making more money mm. and there's like a band of south african artists that are now full-time pro they don't have to have day jobs it's really cool and i'm lucky to be amongst those people um i kind of feel like electronic music's gotten a bit more bro-fied like bro-fied lately 
and it's it's kind of losing in some ways and i'm talking about the bad the bad side of it is that it's it's losing that thing of a place where the misfits and the misunderstoods and the outsiders can Got come you. together you know mm-hmm. which is kind of like the founding principle of techno um and then so now it's like you're at a party and there's just a whole bunch of bros there but but that's so it's really good that more people are listening to it mm-hmm. but i think maybe some of those people are maybe missing that fundamental aesthetic that's meant to be behind electronic music which is this is i hate to use the word safe space but this is like a space of really real creative expression so obviously mostly just gratitude because it's huge and um the scale of what you can do with electronic music blows my mind every day because it's not uncommon to have even mid-tier artists charging four or five thousand euros a show and playing every night for three months so yeah. it's, a, it's a big world it's very inspiring to see how big it is and just globally to see what a cultural phenomenon electronic music is because it actually is a cultural phenomenon like it like yeah if you're an electronic music fan it kind of controls your life it's mm. the next party the next artist the next track so yeah it's cool it's cool to be part of this wave i never thought it was going to get this big i think people have been waiting for it to implode and it just doesn't it just so keeps getting bigger and bigger keeps getting bigger yeah you mentioned uh briefly about how you wouldn't want to be an artist starting out now because there's so many different ways to make music create music yeah what what are some of the tools that you use um has it changed over the years or do you stick to like a tried and tested way of of making beats um i'm i'm a bit of a nazi in a way because i i believe you shouldn't be making music unless you're musically trained to some extent and i think that's why people from the acoustic slash live slash real musician world have this perception that electronic music is not a real musical art Got form. You, yeah. And a lot of cases they're justified in having that opinion because there's a lot of people who don't know what's going on with harmonics or music theory writing god-awful electronic music. So um, my the, the sort of basis of my writing approach is always intensely theoretical and I, I teach music theory and I've done so. That's how I survived my 20s before I was making money from music. So, so, so that's the songwriting idea is at the is at the core of the way I approach electronic production, and then tools wise, yeah, I mean, obviously, new hardware and software comes in all the time. But I think if you use it through a sort of very solid conceptual framework, you're less sort of um, you go on less tangents, you follow less trends, you're just doing it the way that you do it, which is important for me. So, yeah, I mean, obviously, working. I'm so glad that you spoke about CWB in the past tense. I noticed that um, working working in that environment where you're writing songs for radio. Um, as painful as it is sometimes it does teach you a lot about sort of yeah a lot of electronic songs are missing being a song they Mm -hmm. don't really have that theme so that's something I try to work really hard at that every track has a hook or a theme not in like a cheesy way just in like that's a piece of music way so yeah that's pretty much it that's that's my approach and you mentioned the fact that you teach music yeah, theory yeah. Um, am I right in saying that you were quite instrumental in shaping the Soul Candy um, uh, yeah the educational yeah, the educational, the educational thing was my baby yeah so I actually when I started Soul Candy it was just a room in a record store and um, wow. I had one student <laughs> So, and yeah, I just, I was happy that anyone was going to pay me money to teach people how to produce because I was just producing. It meant I could also get hired like nine in the morning. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that, that was cool. Um, it's now Soul Candy is owned by Boston Media Campus and we issue about 1,200 diplomas a year in audio Incredible. technology. Incredible. Which is cool, yeah. So, um, Talking uh, talking about that, the educational thing, it's 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 great. And what happens is you get this wave of people who do their first year and they're really keen. And then some of them may even find a sound, like one sound that they're good at. And then there's the seven or eight year gap until they become like a Felix LeBand or mm, a mm. Aramaniello or a Tresso or someone. It takes it takes a long time. So um, the industry's got to get bigger to support people in that interim growth stage where you're just going pro. You don't want a day job. You want to be doing music full time but there's not enough posts within the industry to keep. There's only a select band of people at the top who get to really be doing this professionally. So yeah, I think that's a challenge. But yeah, I still love the educational thing. I don't I don't teach anymore, but I do have um, a hand in the course material and just making sure that it's up to date and that people are learning techniques that are on par with what's going on overseas at least. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Blanca Mazimela, yeah. who you started Bantuanas with, yes. he was once your he student. He was once my student. This whole team was once my student. Really? At some point. <laughs> yeah. So how did that um, collective come about? I mean, did you, when you were teaching him, did you spot the talent and were you like, that would be someone who I'd want to work with? Yeah, or? well, he survived. That was that's <laughs> always what we look for is the ones that survive. Um, so he survived, a, like he, I think he did an eight-year internship with me. And then um, 
Eight years. Yeah, just like doing, first he did live sound, then he did music theory, then he was a lecturer at Soul Candy, and then we were, he was like opening at all the shows. So it's been a long road for him. And I heard now that he absolutely destroyed Wolf Corp, which is, makes me like feel like wow. proud granddad. Because, um, yeah, look, it's, he's, also, he's also <laughs> got to find, yeah, he's starting to find his sort of identity. I mean, this world is made for extroverts, you know, whoever's shouting the loudest. That's also something that's kind of, not unfortunate, but it's challenging is that whoever's making the most noise is getting the prize, mm. really, which is, it can be conflicting for artists because they're it's naturally mm. introverted people. So generally speaking, the worst artists are making the most noise, I think, <laughs> in general. Um, but anyway, back to Blanca. Yeah, so um, it was kind of inevitable that we were making music together because he was always sitting in the studio sessions and then he really started putting they say like, you've got to put in 10,000 hours to reach that level of mastery. I think he got reached that threshold like two years ago and now he's come up with this really nice catalog he's releasing on Get Physical and All Day I Dream and all these really good labels. So yeah, I mean, Bantuanas is primarily his baby and I'm sort of fulfilling the function as like a ghostwriter slash guest composer. Okay. Um, so yeah, my primary project right now is Murgatroyd and I want to I wanna build a catalog of some of the best electronic music ever written obviously that's brave and bold but i gotta go for the stars yeah quote <laughs> yeah. unquote i quote like unquote. that Feels so fun. are you still signed to get physical um i am like you know it got to a point where there were there were records that i had out that have like millions of streams and listens and it was no um um, just to get physical they're great but the nature of how royalty systems work is that the income is so delayed so if you are a professional artist and you're serious about catalog it doesn't make sense to have someone else owning your rights mm -hmm. and a lot of the functions of the label have been democratized anyway primarily what labels need to do is market mm -hmm. and right now you're marketing yourself as an artist so you know what they used to do is record you and then market you and now you're recording yourself and for all intents and purposes you're marketing yourself so why have someone administering the rights it just doesn't make sense mm -hmm. it, again it just depends i never thought a strategy for me which is common in dance music is oh i'll sign to this label and then like this dude is the head of the label will, will boost my career and you know if you think solomon's going to boost your career he's not he's going to boost his career he's Shane playing solomon. your record in his set but it's not to boost your career so yeah i think i think you have to that's one thing that that was good that i kind of took from the millennial generation is you've got to own this shit you really have to um so yeah, so I think the era of like big labels, big labels benefit big labels. And being an artist on that roster, it may be good for some prestige, but I don't think it's a very good way to make a living from catalog. So are you releasing most of your stuff now under your own imprint? 100%, yeah. Swoon. 100%, Good yeah. name. Yeah, thank you. Strong name. Mark came up with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you mentioned that your presence in Europe is and the club scene is quite strong yeah do you have a team helping you there or do you do everything so I've just like put together the official European team I've had to do a few seasons there to sort of see who the playmakers are and obviously I mean if you think Cape Town's clicky Berlin is just the like sub-genres within sub-genres within sub-genres and you can't possibly talk to this agent to play at that club if you're in this little tiny ecosystem of artists so but yeah we, I have a European agent I played Fusion Fest last year, which is really great. True story, I actually missed Fusion Fest. I Why? missed the biggest festival in the world. Why did you miss it, though? Because... <laughs> That's the real story. <laughs> the real story is... So, so in South Africa... It is on the DL. It is on the DL, but fuck it. <laughs> um, in South Africa, if we book, like, the night of the 27th, mm -hmm. it means Friday night. Yes. Like... But for them, they it's, like, the day early. So they booked me for oh. Friday morning, the 28th. And I rocked up a day, a full 24 hours later because the, the calendars were working differently. Oh, yeah, God. And, yeah, I know. And I played the smallest, shittiest show in Berlin that night to like 20 people in a bar thinking, oh, Fusion's tomorrow. And then when I got back, I had like 600 missed calls from the stage manager. And I still went to Fusion to go like just apologize and beg to be on standby. And they were like, standby? <laughs> There's a 25-year queue for this festival. There's no standby. Oh, my God. So, yeah, they actually told me they're going to put a photo of me up in the office just to remind <laughs> people not to be this fucking retarded. So, sorry, not to be this silly. Um... <laughs> So yeah, it took them, you know, Germans are super dry. So I was trying to make jokes, but after about 48 hours, they, they came around to the hilarity of the situation. Um, so I'm going to go back and do it again. I'm not charging them this time though. Oh, really? Yeah, I had to beg and plead. But yeah, so uh, we've got Fusion coming up again. And um, 
a bunch of really really cool European shows it's still it's still small I don't want to say anyone I've broken in Europe yet because I am geographically isolated but I, I think the strength of the catalog is good enough and I think this is going to be our year there and what sort of advice would you give to anybody who's listening who has a decent social media following um, and you know makes decent beats and is somebody in South Africa but wants to get their music to a European audience or an American audience and play overseas like what what would you advise them to do well one I understand electronic music is a team sport has to be if even to be in the top 1000 of your genre you've got to have some kind of team that means an agent in whatever city you're wanting to play in catalog is obviously everything and European agents are notoriously difficult in saying like one track's not going to cut it I want to hear your last three your next five I want to see that you have a release schedule managed you know South African artists do silly um, silly things in a rush like they make this track and then they put it up for free on their Instagram or give it away on SoundCloud um, and that's something that I took from from um, Jared at Jet Traeger is one thing I really took from our relationship is just slow down, manage the schedule properly, put out good work and promote it properly. And even to get a track on Spotify playlists and stuff, you need these eight-week properly planned release schedules. So I think that's vital. Um, yep. And yeah, I, I think the team, the team thing really has changed the way I look at it. I actually, not to get too esoteric, but I took a lot from the the martial arts sort of lifestyle and try to put it into music production because I think a lot of creatives aren't very disciplined. So I was reading um, The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield and he just talks about showing up and waiting for the muse, which is a huge part of the process. Just if you're in there every day, the statistical likelihood of you having a great session or running a great chord progression or a great hook, it goes up exponentially. So yeah, put yourself in there more often and surround. It's so so much of the confusion of music making happens because you're in your own head and you're judging it. And you also got to check your ego before you go into studio. You know, if you if you writing music so people like you or desire you or whatever it is, you're lost already. So it has to be a pure creative pursuit um, done in amongst people you trust who have similar vision for music to you, and then just get the team right and control the the strategy. Mm. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit about Crazy White Boy because that's how I know you because I joled at I don't even know how many show of your shows <laughs> um, and I got yeah I got more more than my fair share of wrecked during them um, I don't blame you but <laughs> but how um, how did your <laughs> I'm just fucking with you I'm just fucking with you <laughs> oh my god um, your your musical partnership um, with Kostakis how, yeah. how, how did that start so so the thing is it was always um, like I was like the Mlungu lecturer at Soul Candy I was like not making any racially inflammatory but I was like the token white dude at Soul Candy and I was the only white dude who was interested in that deeper was like really proper deep house like Louis Vega and all that stuff and that was the sound that I was exposed to and I was coming from like a EDM electro background at the time and that's when I really got into Deep House. And, and yeah, that, that golden era of like Soul Candy Deep House, it really changed the way that I, that I wrote and mm. thought about theory. So, and then Costa was in my class. And when we started, man, it was just, it was meant to just be pure fun. It was just two white dudes making this kind of black influenced music in a time where things were a lot less political. And you could still do like this gimmick stuff. And I thought the music was really cool for the first five or six years. And then we had this mega hit with Love You Better. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the vultures jumped in and they were like, do that again, do this again, be more like this. And we, and then at the same time, I we also really became serious about production. We wanted to try and we wanted to try and sort of rinse our creative ambition into the Crazy White Boy project, which is never going to work. It was just too commercial. So every time we found something too good, it wasn't Crazy White Boy enough. So yeah, it just eventually turned into like an artistic struggle. Um, but yeah, Costa and I, I mean, we just put out a record individually on my label. And we, we're continually making music together, just um, not with such a strong focus on that alias. And yeah, you know, again, look, for most people, that's probably a little slice of heaven, you know, they'd love it because we were charging great money. It was, it was cool to be in that project for a while, but um, it was not charging me up with creative energy anymore. I just felt the need to do something a bit more authentic mm -hmm. for myself, yeah. I've also realized that, like, now that I'm in my 30s, I don't jaw as much as I used to when I was in my 20s. So, like, yeah. things have calmed down hectically. And I can imagine that with a crazy schedule of gigging and being on the road and, you know, then versus now, you know, owning your own imprint and doing your doing all of your, the stuff by yourself yeah. <clears throat> for, your, for your solo career. Yeah. How have things changed 
from you for for you over the years? I mean, you just can't be unhealthy. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. And that's not to say I don't partake in any of the pleasures of of what we do, but it is with a lot of of discipline. Um, so yeah, like the substance abuse had to, had to get moderated. And I mean, I say there's someone who still smokes too much weed and stuff, but I, I try not to get trashed at shows. And I mean, health is what is wellness. It's a deep question. It goes down to the people you're surrounded with, how well you feel, integration, social integration, all these different things, how you're eating, nutrition. So that's a huge theme in my life because you can't write good music if you're I could in my 20s. Like in my 20s, I was drawing on all this anguish and pain and I was overweight and miserable and, and I wrote great music like that and now it just doesn't work. I need to be in a good space. So so there's this discipline required to do that, which I think is really important. Um, yeah, and just, I mean, we, you are getting paid to perform and I, electronic music is kind of difficult already because people are, most of them don't really care and I like to go in and put on big live shows. So there's so much gear and so much tech and so much pressure. Yeah, so that's definitely changed. I feel like I'm doing a job now when, when I'm on the road and I'm definitely a lot more disciplined. And um, yeah, I don't think much else has changed. I, I'm i still fucking hungry. Like I feel like I have something to prove in the studio. Mm. And I still have these like transcendental out-of-body experiences where I like lose time and it's five in the morning. And I, that's why I do this shit. I love that state of consciousness, that deep, deep flow state creativity. So, yeah, I've, I've always been motivated by that and I think I always will be. And when I stop feeling that, I'll stop doing it for sure. So, mm. yeah. Um, yeah, it's just gotten a lot calmer in a way, like adult fun now, you know? Adult fun. Adult fun, yeah. I mean, I do, I do think ele electronic music, it is a cool environment. You know, live music is a cool environment. You do meet people who are like on their true form. You get, you get a glimpse. I always say like being an entertainer you get like a master class in human psychology because what you see at 2am that's real human nature it's 100%. fucking terrifying <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so yeah that answers your question I think and I'm also I was very very um, surprised to learn that I'm not the only one here who has a podcast you also you are very very um, way ahead of your <laughs> of your time yeah because you started uh, what was it called Deep, Deep in the Mong Deep in the Mong yeah. in like 2016 I think, I think it yeah, was yeah maybe even earlier yeah, maybe even earlier. Deep yeah, um, I yeah. listened to one of your episodes where you detail your your ayahuasca I'm trip. Sorry, which, I'm so sorry. <laughs> where you went to yeah. South America yeah. to the Amazon, yeah, to do that whole experience. I mean, where do you even begin to talk about that? Well, firstly, um, so before I had any team, when I wrote my my like breakthrough work, which is called Ecolimba, I was literally in like a cottage in Camps Bay with a broken speaker. And I had this crazy German neighbor upstairs who was a fucking maniac and he would never let me turn the music up. So I used to make music on headphones. I was like, my house was just filled with cigarette stompies and like dry bread. It was a dark time. And I had such bad anxiety that I'd bitten my nails like until they bled. And I was just like waking up with my heart pounding every day. And like I was just exercising so much. I was just never calm. And yeah, it was, it was just a brutal time for whatever reason in my internal world. And then I was just so exhausted after that EP. And I'd been doing a little bit of like going to nature and doing San Pedro, which is the cactus, the sister cactus to ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. Strongly recommend if anyone's interested in psychedelics and you want somewhere to start, I strongly recommend starting with San Pedro because it's the most light, most easy to handle, nicest on the body beautiful beautiful plant medicine this is all like super new to me so you're gonna have to give me some of those books that we spoke about i will i'll give you i've got literally i i honestly think i may have the best library on psychedelic medicine in the world <laughs> you yeah, heard it i've got first. a huge yeah <laughs> so yeah i'll give you something too but so anyway so yeah then i decided let me just go see what all the fuss is about and um my aim was just getting my anxiety and compulsive thinking as well and because addiction is ultimately a compulsive behavior we're mm -hmm. getting way too deep now but um never okay never. okay um yeah so just bring bring all of my compulsive behaviors and addictions and anxiety under control and i mean i did manage to achieve that my i used to have this terribly physical like anxiety and it's definitely changed and now i'm just stressed i'm not like feeling this physical dread and angst so that was one major shift it changed a lot of a lot of things about a lot of my views about a lot of things um so yeah i'm actually feeling quite disconnected from that plant medicine world because one of the things I decided when I got back was I was in too much of an esoteric like lofty conceptual headspace and it was mm -hmm. time to you know it's one thing reading about and 
going on spiritual retreats and, and doing all the stuff, but like, can you pay rent? <laughs> you know, do you have a clean shirt in your cupboard? So that was grossly imbalanced in my, in my 20s. And now it's just been, you know, getting some of the real world adult shit taken care of and actually starting to scratch the surface of what I'm capable of as a producer and artist and label owner. And then going back with that sort of sense of achievement back into the plant medicine world. I think that's, that's my aim for this year. Do you feel like you found a balance between the two? Definitely. If anything, now I'm over over leaning toward the capitalist getting shit done side of things, you know, which has been great. Like I've got a lot of shit together and released a ton of music. Um, but there's a different level of connection to yourself, like a deep self-knowledge. And I, I must say, since I haven't been doing plant medicine, I feel, like I said, I'm more disciplined than ever, but I feel that old tendency to like smoke just consume things like especially when i'm when i'm creating so like a more of a dependency on substances and external things instead mm -hmm. of having this deep sense of grounding that i have when i'm doing plant medicine often but you need both you know you have to be a bit batshit to make great art as well mm. you can't always just be zen and eating fucking falafel salads and sometimes you got to go on a fucking three-day coke man you, it's part of the process Shut you know um yeah I feel like, what's that, what's that like old saying? Like the line between insanity and creativity is like incredibly thin. 100%. And another concept that I really like from plant medicine is the difference between like a highly trained shaman, like a very um, accomplished medicine man and a schizophrenic. It's just integration because they've both tasted that edge of insanity, but just one person manages to integrate it and then... Yeah, become a, an integrated whole human being and the other person that snaps them and a lot of the difference has to do with social support and upbringing the conceptual framework that you live in and all these things so yeah Whew, that was deep <laughs> no I can never get too deep but okay. no, no, it's cool. all good um, but so you mentioned a few things this year projects that you're working on festivals that you're <laughs> you're going to eventually play yeah. um, but what what else is in the pipeline because you you seem like an incredibly busy person and there are always ideas floating around and there are always, you know, projects to be worked on. But what what are some of the things that your main focus okay, is for 2020? So specifics. Um, so one, I have a project coming up with the Soweto Gospel Choir, which is very exciting. Incredible. Yeah, they're three, three time Grammy Award winners. And I got approached by, I can't give too many details, but I got approached by a corporate to try and um, record them and bring them into like the sort of context of electronic music which will be a lot more subversive and less happy and gospel um, so that's one thing which I'm wow. terribly excited about. there's a lot of those I think um, uh, yeah I've, I've, I think I'm really glad to be getting the respect as a composer because I really do work hard at composition. I'm not classically trained or whatever, so it's quite a different take on composition that I have, but I do work really hard at it. And So there's that project, and then there's another project coming up with Cape Philharmonic Orchestra that I can't say too much about, but it's for Guy Fox and it's at Kirsten Bosch. And um, basically I'm going to be scoring a 90-minute piece of electronic electronic slash orchestral music and what? I'm going to be playing it with them at Kirsten Bosch which is really cool so those are like that's the stuff that really excites me creatively um, and I think it's going to um, I think it's going to sort of yeah op open open the world up I, I, the dream was to do Soweto Gospel Choir on top of Table Mountain with Circle the French brand so so that's, that's definitely a goal and then just I'm going to be at ADE building better structure for the label playing some good shows I mean the shows are ultimately what we do for a living and obviously you get great shows and you get okay shows and get terrible shows <coughs> but yeah it's those it's those projects of um really just making awesome music with world-class musicians and yeah that's what really is exciting me i've yeah. never been to ade before um but everybody sort of talks about it as like the holy grail of electronic music in terms of like people that you meet and yeah. everyone that you're exposed to Definitely. have you have you been before yeah i have i have um, yeah, you ha you've got to do the work before you go to these conferences. I think that's important. Um, so, if, but if you have good catalog, if you have like your next five releases planned, and you you've got your socials and your branding and your EBK is right, and you've got a plan, it's there's no better money that you can spend because you will meet aggregators, distributors, label heads, owners, festival promoters, all these people that make up the ecosystem. So, yeah, you know, there's a lot of people. The Barrier to entry right now is high, you know, because there's so many people trying to do the same thing. So it takes so many people like on your team to cross that threshold to like the next level. Mm -hmm. For example, Floyd like has just crossed that level. Like and it took him ages. He was like up against this elastic band of resistance and now it like popped through and he he, 
he crossed that threshold and now he's like a real international. And you can see when he comes back here, he's like a, he was a South African, but he's not anymore. <laughs> it's a, do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a mindset change that happens. It happens. It's just happened to Coffee as well. It's kind of Kulo's like on the verge as well. And I'm kind of on the verge of that transition as well now. So, yeah. Do you feel like you can ever be ready for that kind of step? I, I reckon, I think we're ready. I think we're ready. I, I, the biggest challenge in breaking is you start making shit music because you're always touring. So I've actually been almost like, I don't know, maybe I'm just wishful thinking, but I feel like the universe has kept me here because I hadn't written my best catalog yet. Like if I'd gone overseas on the merits of my records from three years ago, I would have probably not have written what I'm writing now. So I want to I want to rinse the catalog out and then go overseas. But yeah, historically speaking, very few people hit a prolific run of music writing and then keep it up while touring. It's incredibly hard to do that. Mm. So yeah. Um. So, Ryan, talk to me a little bit about your new track, We Go Walking, on your imprint. Okay, so um, it's one of those tracks that I've been writing for like four years and it's had a million different versions. Um, obviously, we're trying to balance cinematic electronica, which is what I want to get known for. But when you put out good records, you get booked to headline festivals and you've got to be able to adapt all this really cinematic music to club music. So that's one of the challenges we're having on Swoon. This um, this track's pure club madness. It's not cinematic at all anymore. Um, so yeah, it's um, it's really cool. It's actually the follow up to my track Wicked Eyes, which was the debut on on Swoon, and it's out on the twenty eighth of February. It's a, there's a mix by myself and Mark, and then we've got two international remixes as well. And then a month after that, um, I've got Era Maniello, who's the first not only the first African artist, but the first artist other than myself to release on the label. He's got an EP called Hold You Forever and I've done a, a remix that's exclusive for the label and that's out on the 27th of March. So, see, tons see. of stuff. I con huh? Consistently busy. Consistently busy, consistently all the time. Consistently busy. Consistently pretending to be busy. <laughs> <laughs> we go walking and hold you forever. Yeah. Check them out. You know where to find me. Two you know what to up. do. Thank Enjoy. you. On the Spotify's, on the Apple Music. Hit a lot, <laughs> smash the size, leave a comment, tell us why you dig it. <laughs> if you're looking for new music, you know it is like me, Ryan Murgatroyd on Spotify and Instagram.
shout out to Ryan Murgatroyd for joining us in studio. Thanks for joining us for another Tex Talks. Check out textinthecity.com for more episodes. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and listen to Tex Talks on all good streaming platforms. For myself, Tex, our producers, Jonathan Engs and Matt Lewitz, and our assistant researcher and collaborator, Al Clapper, catch y'all on the flip side.